The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Willett with the Intertribal Council of Michigan's National Native Network. Welcome to the NNN webinar series on cancer risk reduction in Indian country. This webinar is titled, Two Tobacco Ways, Centering Traditional Tobacco. This technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the National Native Network with the Indian Health Service Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, which offers technical assistance and resources for commercial tobacco prevention and control through Indian country. Your presenters today are Coco v Vialus from Clearway, Minnesota, Lori Newbress from Clearway, Minnesota, and the Honorable Joshua Hudson, Program Manager with the National Native Network. There has been no commercial interest support used to fund this activity. We will not be offering CEUs for this webinar. And by the end of this webinar, participants will be able to understand the two tobacco ways, learn culturally appropriate policy strategies, and understand how to work with tribal communities to write policy for the way they want to live. Please type your questions into the question box on the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Questions will be answered during the last few minutes of the webinar. Tomorrow, you'll also receive a webinar survey link uh, to a SurveyMonkey survey to evaluate our webinar. Thank you. And now at this time, I will turn it over to Lori Newbrest. Okay. Um, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Lori Newbrest and I'm a member of the Blackfeet Tribe of Montana, but also a member of the Blackfoot Confederacy that is in Montana and also in the province of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, and so today we're, we're going to look at, I think really um, in Indian country right now, you could call this, you know, the two tobacco ways, you know, centering traditional tobacco in cardiovascular care and diabetes, in spiritual wellness and cultural health and cultural well-being and because another way to reinterpret policies is to really uh, look at how we got to where we are today in terms of how we have boundaries in our communities which is another way of looking at policies and to share the work that has been done um, in this modern um, tobacco movement you know uh, sort of spearheaded by uh, the fire lit by the master settlement agreement in the late 1990s and um and i hope you will i think most of you were out of school or you're just starting school you know in the 1990s but um it's really uh looking at those approaches that have borne success um in indian country but also also in alaska i think that you know, sometimes when we talk broadly and we start using uh, language about, particularly about commercial tobacco use, the diversity in Indian country is complex, exciting, and it, it has a lot of opportunities. And when we look at our northern neighbors to understand that there are, there are cultures that uh, use tobacco as their central um, to their cultural um, practices and way of life. So that's me. I guess that's that. And then I think Coco, she'll be presenting right after me. And then Joshua or Josh. I'm just waiting for my slide. Back. So I think uh, when it's one of the the most uh, fascinating things that happened uh, when finally, you know, after the master settlement through state mechanisms, um, when American Indian tribes and Alaskan Native, you know, uh, villages and tribes up there were able to participate in addressing, starting to address the toll that commercial tobacco has on our people. It really brought an opportunity, I think, for many people to start to say, well, what is our relationship with tobacco? 
And because of where we were at, I think in terms of the availability and the free sharing of our religious practices, you know, um, prior to 1978, you know, the 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 sort sort of the stories were were quieted in some of the teachings. And so I think really after 2000, when this came to uh, my people in Montana, we looked at. One, we actually had a word for tobacco, or one word for it, and to really understand that traditional tobacco was here in this hemisphere prior to contact, and that there was a vibrant indigenous tobacco control that cultures have practiced, who used it for uses beyond what has been subscribed in the main, the mainstream tobacco movement to address commercial tobacco addiction. And to see the complexity of how tobacco has, traditional tobacco has held our world together um, prior to contact. And then as the availability, you know, sort of why was then, what happened to traditional tobacco during the um, historical trauma period or to the contact period after it was you know, first introduced to European explorers, you know, in 1492. And so some of the work that started was really to begin to, in a way, on understand that ball of cultural mixing around jurisdictions, around, you know, what had, once the United States was formed, the economic sort of uh, way of looking at tobacco through to a commerce land, the Western commerce land in Indian country. Um, but it's rooted prior to contact. And then there's a lot of diversity in how people relate to the natural gifts given by the creator to people um, so that they can live well, so that they could be guided in decisions, so that they can have public, what now people call public safety, or you have cultural safety. So. I think um, we all, or for my community and my experience since really 2000, um, I came into tobacco, I think, from traditional tobacco teaching to help pe teach people life skills. And I really see um, that we're, you know, this is a life skill to understand these two tobacco ways. And, So I'm just going to, I'm going to move through the slides, but I understand you'll have them as a reference. So what we came to um, in the early 2000s in my community through coalition building, through a, a grant for the master settlement um, agreement um, ministered through the state of Montana to the tribe, is I went as, you know, the person given this responsibility from my nation to began to say, how do we talk about this? So it came to where really to talk about the reinstatement of policies or for protocols and ways of being of the way we wanted to live, the way we wanted to move into the future, I had to do some, some opening up, I think, of the dialogue around tobacco. And, you know, I had many people tell me they didn't, they didn't know the word. And I think since then, I, um, I guess I'm your um, practice-based evidence person that it's so beautiful what has happened. And so through the continued sharing, the support through many um, American Indian coalitions all across the U.S. and in Canada and um, other parts of the world with indigenous people, by 2017, this, the Two Tobacco Ways principle started to, um, it still holds the concepts and the principles and the values of the original definition that was used um, in my community in the Blackfeet Coalition in 2000. But it, it kind of, now you see it on the screen, the two, two tobacco waste principles. And so I think it, it's really important like just to hear the intention behind the, the guiding principles. You know, the indigenous healing traditions of whatever word that medicine was called among, you know, the people that it was originally gifted to. You know, it was given to our ancestors 
by the creator, by the govern the universal governance of life. And it's governed by um, using the English word, you know, the sacred protocols for spiritual, cultural, and ceremonial uses. And really what happened is a critical break. And for some people it was a break, but just like now um, we can see, we can, um, I think, hold heart with uh, all the, in, you know, anything indigenous. I just seen the like uh, uh, um, uh, an article come across, you know, my, my news feed about indigenous fashion designers. So really anything indigenous now, you could see the expression of really the and the creativity the the desire to do for people to do their best on behalf of their cultural way of life really concerned again to lift up that value of that everything we did was for cultural well-being and really that collective mindset you can see expressed in the two tobacco waste principles but how did we get to where our communities, even our children, our unborn, are so, you know, um, the effect, the burden of commercial tobacco use in our community, despite all, you know, prior to 2000 and even now, the education around, um, you know, if all it took was a report in 1964, everybody would have quit. But in our country, we have to look at how, instead of why, how did this happen? And I think that the two tobacco waste principle really wants to lift up that idea that instead of the, the individual being responsible for the universal system in creating it in their image, that really they're part of the relationship. And that's in all cultures, indigenous cultures in this hemisphere, about that you're taught to have, you know, relationship with everything in your world, with your, with the universe, with the other um, um, earth, uh, natural medicine, sacred medicine. And for many people, tobacco was that way. But so what happened? Why are we at this point where you know, um, everybody in Indian country, regardless of how you define that, has been touched by the loss of a family member, a loved one, or a friend through commercial tobacco use and addiction. And, and looking at, you know, how do we move forward in a good way, not to cause further harm by policy practices, because we all know what has been result of one policy is effective has been effective in Indian country. And we know this now because there's a healthy dialogue everywhere about historical trauma. And I think in the two tobacco waste principle, we have continually not we have dedicated ourselves to recognizing that the condition we're in now is very recent to how our, our, our people all lived, regardless of the culture you come from. And to really look at that, that great change that came to Indian country, um, and it came in different ways, you know, it came with contact. That once uh, commercial tobacco or the tobacco vision or paradigm was changed with the Europeans coming back and commercializing it uh, historically, when it came to people, it was used as a way to um, negotiate, you know, treaties, to guarantee safe passage, to because also other people recognize the power of tobacco. And the industry has really, um, you know, they're good at what they do. And when it came to Indian country, are people at a time when commercial tobacco use became the only available tobacco for many, many communities and cultures? We were really at a point we had suffered land loss. There were things that had fractured our world. Land loss, you know, the, the breakup of our communities and families, our clan systems, our societies. 
and the the historical trauma or the trauma that we were experiencing a substance that is highly addictive that is mood altering really came into widespread use and it was often free with the commodity and you know I, I told myself don't bring up sacred commodity cheese but you know, if we look at the original um, commodities or treaty annu uh, annuities that were given to communities, commercial tobacco was in there. And then as the industry changed it pro its product um, to target the brain in ways that we now know are, you know, devastating to people because it's that, you know, sort of that tricky trickster medicine where you are ingesting something and you know, the hit may be good, you're, it's, it's telling you it's good in your brain, but what, you know, everything in your body is, is experiencing, you know, really a deprivation of health. So as we move through uh, working with many tribes um, and indigenous cultures where they were trying to, you know, revive, recover, um, reclaim, celebrate their way of life as a strategy to restore cultural health, which meant for in our paradigm, you restore everybody's health. So that's a key point, I think, in the two tobacco ways. When you restore and dedicate to the cultural well-being in our way of thinking, you are improving the health of the individual. So we want to go to the same place as mainstream tobacco addressing commercial tobacco effects but it's critical that our paradigm is the guiding force because right now in indian country there are a lot of a lot of discussions about how we return to cultural well-being and you see well-being uh, wellness i've seen you know you can even get a certificate on the internet you know <laughs> but uh, that's another webinar um, so, really, when we came into the work in Minnesota, there was, um, I think I covered some of this, uh, there was an opportunity to start saying and to further that discussion, to say, if we want to work on policy, then we must, it is our responsibility to talk about the the policy relationship in Indian country around engagement with all the cultures over time. And there had been healthy discussion in the 80s and 90s in Indian country about starting to address in a culturally based way our restoration of well-being and even just basic safety. And so it started sometimes with this education. And the photo you see now it was taken um, during the World Tobacco Conference, and there were a number of indigenous people there, and we went to see the new American Indian Museum on the Smithsonian Mall, and we came up on these beautiful tobacco plants. And I seen this image, and I was just like, oh, they knew it, they got, you know, they got it right, because in the lower right-hand hand corner, you see a commercial tobacco cigarette but yet they're, they're celebrating the indigenous legacy of our culture, the beauty, the knowledge, the cultural systems of knowledge that had a built-in reconciliation and restorative function and that were guided by traditional medicines or traditional practices and protocols. So this photo is, you know, anyone can use it. It's been used all over and, um, but it was really, I think, a defining moment for visually, because you can teach off this. And um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. But also when we would talk about historical trauma in terms of policy and its effect on our people, this next photo kind of kind of sums it up. You have the indigenous tobacco plant um, thriving before contact. You have the American Indian Museum you know, the inclusion now of American, um, the heritage of the country. And then you have the Capitol building in the background. And I think that the complexity and really it's a dynamic world if, uh, 
you know, in policy, there's never a dull day, just like on any Indian reservation or Alaska village, there is no dull day in Indian country. And so this was really used as a teaching slide because we had to also dedicate ourselves in the two tobacco ways to educating funders, allies, um, you know, people that have dedicated their life uh, with, with as much passion as any American Indian or Alaskan Native to addressing the devastation of commercial tobacco use on communities and families. So we began to uh, look at, you know, sort of the verbiage and also working with tribes who, um, they were already in the process of restoring their well being. So we're not coming in to do two people um, using the traditional uh, two tobacco waste principle, but to do with people, to really support those ways, to meet the community where they're at, to support those ways that are going to lead them to the healing practices, to the events, to the uh, really the continual education of elected tribal leadership to national organizations, you know, basically who would have, whoever would let us in the door that could be a potential ally. Because it was really a unique way to sort of um, begin to bring clarity to a situation that, you know, I mean, pun intended, that was clouded by commercial tobacco smoke. And so when we talk about policies in Indian country, there are there are many, many opportunities where you can now, um, you know, Fond du Lac uh, community banning e-cigarettes before that was even on the general population agenda. Um, other tribes banning, uh, you know, fruit flavored are um, starting to address the use of uh, electronic cigarettes. And there's a lot of opportunities. Um, it's still around tobacco, tobacco policy control. And some of the two ordinances, the tribal ordinances that have been passed, resolutions, you know, dedications at national organizational level, they have included those protect that protective fact factors of language to preserve if tobacco is at the center of their culture. So there is built into our policy effort that dedication and that um reaffirming the right to uh not the right just the practice to be who you are to be the best person that you could be you know be the best indian and that means that for a lot of people that is that they hold dear they um they are guided by traditional tobacco and so in minnesota there was there um is a special effort that uh you know, over the last 10 years that has really taken hold, well, even more longer than that. And, um, but really, this is sort of a guiding principle now how uh, the two tobacco ways is, is developing, is the messaging that traditional tobacco is not commercial tobacco. And this has brought together a dynamic, uh, I think, set of folks, you know, indigenous food folks, indigenous farmers, traditional seed keepers, um, and also traditional practitioners of, of cultural healing. That to the, so the discussion along with tribal leadership, along with public health professionals, um, funders, has led to led to some really dynamic, I think, things that have happened in Minnesota. So I believe this is my last slide, um, and Coco Villalo will take over. We all have our stay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Coco Villalo, and you know I just really want to thank you, Lori, um, for being such a pioneer. Um, and, you know, the word two tobacco ways principle and framework is uh, really from the work that she has led in Montana um, and in her community that has really helped to 
us in our work in Minnesota around, um, you know, the two tobacco ways and, and understanding traditional tobacco. And, you know, every time I was uh, wanting to try to write down, because she was doing all these amazing little nuggets of information and I was wanting to tweet it, but I, <laughs> I just always learned something new. So I just thank you so much, Lori, um, you know, for all your work and leadership uh, around these issues and um, showing the way. Um, so what I really wanted to talk to you guys about today is some of the efforts that we have going on in um, Minnesota. Uh, we have worked with some amazing, um, you know, community members and the tribes in Minnesota, and it's, it's always a fun adventure. And, uh, you know, we just want to acknowledge them and thank them so much for, you know, helping us, uh, you know, learn about these different policy and education pieces um, as we're doing this work. Because like Lori said, it's really, um, you know, writing the way, writing policies the way that we want to live. Um, and, you know, when we first started this Tribal Tobacco Education and Policy Initiative in Minnesota um, 10 years ago, you know, we, we had our guidelines, um, but at the forefront of all of it was making sure that the restoration of traditional tobacco was the foundation of creating the change around education and policy pieces. And um, so we had a lot of advocates who wanted to talk about, you know, taking their powwow smoke free or taking parks smoke free or their different health and um, human services areas smoke free. Um, but, you know, it was a it was a very, you know, fine line on how they would want to walk and <clears throat> Um, we really supported the, the efforts and the movement to talk about um, traditional tobacco, talking about the growing and harvesting and what tobacco meant um, for individuals, the different protocols and teachings for their communities. Um, so when, when you uh, come to Minnesota, you're going to just hear a lot about these traditional tobacco efforts. Um, and, you know, some of the campaigns that we started were always in collaboration with community members. Um, before we would even, you know, move forward with whether it was a brochure, calendar, um, billboards that we're going to walk through um, shortly here, was making sure we talked to the community at the very beginning and asking what their input was, what was their, um, you know, vision, um, what, what their voices and stories wanted to, you know, highlight when we were doing this work. Um, and so these are going to actually be examples of what was created um, for some of our mass media campaigns um, to help support their policy initiatives. We know that all the tribes have, you know, their own ways of doing things. Um, we respect the sovereignty and all the different components and protocols that come with that. And so when we were trying to create these campaigns that were on the statewide level um, to be representative and reflective of all the different tribal um, groups represented in Minnesota, um, these were something that uh, uh, all of the um, community agreed on and supported. Um, so these first images that you see are our very first campaigns that came out, gosh, maybe over five years ago now. Um, and you see, value our tradition, um, keep tobacco sacred. Those messages were agreed upon by everybody that, um, you know, provided input. We made sure that when we were creating the mock-ups with our communications and marketing team, um, that this is what they wanted to see. They wanted to see elders. They wanted to see young people. They didn't want to see, um, you know, different like smoking lungs and bad habits because they know that commercial manufactured tobacco, you know, they know it causes harm, death and disease in their community. Um, our community members wanted to make sure that they see, you know, the beautiful, vibrant um, myths of our communities and what tobacco represented. And so this was our first campaign um, that reflected the first uh, uh campaign uh, initiative that we did around Keep Tobacco Sacred. And at the bottom, you'll see our quick plan um, services, so another type of call to action. But again, the, the most prominent pieces are, you know, the faces of the community with the taglines um, that they chose. Um, this was our next go around. We wanted to make sure that we kind of kept digging a little further. So we had value of the tradition, um, keep tobacco sacred. So the next kind of call to action was keep the tradition, break the addiction, um, keep tobacco sacred. Um, in Minnesota, we had a uh, tribal tobacco use prevalence study that um, was with some of the tribes to really hone in on um, individual tribal rates that the tribes own and um, have the rights to. We don't necessarily know those um, numbers, but we know that at the statewide rate in Minnesota, 59% of American Indian adults smoke. Um, but we're trying to, you know, flip of the messaging and honoring, again, the, the medicines. Um, and so this was our next tagline of um, keep the tradition, break the addiction. And again, you see a member from the community um, that was, again, agreed upon by um, the majority of the community members that we work with in Minnesota. Uh, this next campaign um, that you see is a mural that was done at the Minneapolis American Indian Center um, right on Franklin Avenue. If you guys are ever in um, Minneapolis, I highly recommend you guys see this. Now, this wall kind of looks 
um, you know, small on the screen, but it is actually 3,306 square feet. It was a pretty big blank wall. Um, and we had two different types of community conversations um, that were led by the Native Youth Alliance of Minnesota to really, again, listen to the community on what they would like to see on this wall. Um, and on the left-hand side, you'll see the Anishinaabe creation story. On the right, you'll see the Dakota creation story. Um, and in the middle, you'll see a young girl who was actually a member from um, the Little Earth community in Minnesota. And the words that you see on top is, I see generations. Um, one of the questions was asked, you know, what is your vision of a healthy community? And this uh, nine-year-old little girl says, I see generations. Um, she sees healthy people. She sees, you know, people dancing of all ages. Um, again, Keep Tobacco Sacred was at the forefront because when we we're talking about these different um, creation stories, um, you know, how everything begins in a lot of our communities, it all starts with tobacco. Um, and so this is something that uh, is reflective, again, of the conversations with, co with community. Um, and when you're driving along the highway, you can see this mural. It's pretty huge. And um, this one doesn't have it, but if you have some uh, members standing against the wall, they'll be as tall as the words in the Keep Tobacco Sacred. So it's a, it's a pretty big fight, but um, just another example of how the work um, has evolved. It, it went more of an artistic um, way and just again to help engage in the discussions. This next piece is uh, Reclaiming Sacred Tobacco Documentary. Um, so often we've seen on um, you know televisions, local broadcasting, uh, you know how the harms have affected us. Um, but again, when we're talking about traditional tobacco in our communities, it has a very different meaning. So this really took us on the journey of, you know, what traditional tobacco means, um, how it's been uh, manipulative, manipulated, stolen, um, but again, to where we are, we're reclaiming it. Um, you see examples of lacrosse, you see examples of um, some community members using art um, as a way to talk about traditional tobacco. And we're very proud of this because this was, uh, you know, the conversation started with community members. Um, we had a native producer, and we uh, recently won a 2017 Midwest Emmy on this. Um, and we can send the link out to you all after this. Uh, it's an online 26 minute documentary. There's also three additional shorts that talk about uh, some other um, tobacco issues. But again, it, it's a focusing on the beauty of what tobacco is um, for many native people. Um, the next piece, is uh, talking about the gathering of Native Americans, the Gona. Um, we held two Gonas um, focused solely on traditional tobacco that were held in Minnesota. That um, the first one started out with, you know, uh, people from all the different tribes in Minnesota, um, and then the second one that we had really took a national um, initiative where we had people from um, across this um, nation attend. Um, in collaboration with uh, the Shakopee Midwakachin Sioux community, as well as our sponsors, Clearway Minnesota and Blue Cross. Um, but uh, we really want to pause right now to, to turn it over to the Honorable Josh Hudson um, to share his experience on what um, he learned as part of this uh, GONA initiative. Ah, thanks, Coco. Bonjour, everybody. So my name is Josh Hudson and I work with the National Native Network and I was just gonna chat a little bit about my experience with GONA, um, the Gathering of Native Americans. So I didn't attend the first one, but I attended the second one. Um, and the picture is up on the screen right now. And it was just a really enriching experience. So GONA is just all around a really um, heartwarming healing experience, but it was really cool because the GONA focused on traditional tobacco. And so if you look at the bottom of the picture, um, you'll see like a ring of green, uh, and those are actually tobacco plants. So, you know, through the GONA, we were doing this hard work and talking about, you know, as uh, Lori mentioned earlier, what fractured our community? And, you know, how do we help heal and repair those, those fractures and move forward stronger um, and together? And you know, we really identified that tobacco was one of those centerpieces of how, how we really heal our community. Um, and so, you know, we did all this work and you know, it was just really awesome. And then at the end, they had all these tobacco plants that they gave us. And uh, I actually flew home with um, 12 tobacco plants because they were just extras. So I flew home with 12 and actually only six uh, ended up surviving because the airplane was really cold. It was the dead of summer. So the airplanes were just really chilly. Um, and from there, actually, that started my 
journey within the traditional tobacco movement of growing my own tema, my own traditional tobacco. <clears throat> and that was, you know, the rest of my summer was, you know, all about taking care of my, my tema plants, my tobacco plants, and, you know, and taking on this new role in my life. Um, so it was just really exciting. And this summer is gearing up for, you know, growing more tobacco plants because I have seeds and, you know, I'm continuing that work because it's, you know, when we talk about tobacco control, it's easy to focus on the program level or the national level or, you know, the community level things, but really tobacco control too, looking at it from the, you know, the two ways of tobacco, traditional tobacco control is, you know, reclaiming and, you know, reusing it in our lives. So that's bringing the tobacco plants back into our lives and growing them and sustaining them and working with them because it's a relationship that we have to be building. You know, me individually, but like with my little cousins or with my family members, or, you know, I know I worked places where that was a, a centerpiece for youth programming was creating a healthy relationship with the youth and tobacco plants. So, you know, this is something that I've taken on very personally, you know, that was offered to me through this experience, you know, Gona, it was such an amazing experience generally, but the tobacco plants were a really big thing for me too. But that's all I have at the moment, Coco. Thank you so much, Josh. And uh, if you see, Josh is right in the center with the best uh, smile on there. Um, and we just, you know, thank you for sharing that story because um, what you see here is a, a beautiful representation of what Josh and Lori were both talking about, um, you know, in this legacy, in this movement. You know, five, 10 years ago, um, we didn't necessarily see traditional tobacco, tobacco plants, um, you know, or necessarily had access. And, um, you know, in 2015, when Shakopee so generously gifted us um, 100 tobacco plants to be grown, we now can go across Minnesota and now across the country um, and really ask um, people to, you know, if we needed traditional tobacco, um, there would be some. So we just see this really beautiful resurgence um, of the traditional tobacco, um, you know, coming back and uh, people just having access to it, which is just, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, and, you know, it's just, you have to just be so thankful for our ancestors who kept a lot of these traditions alive for us um, through all of the different pieces that Lori was talking about with the trauma. Um, you know, we're still here. Um, we're still connected by this beautiful plant. Um, and, you know, it, it ties into a lot of different pieces. Um, like Lori was mentioning, um, the indigenous foods where we're talking about, um, you know, indigenous games such as lacrosse. Um, a lot of these, um, you know, beginnings and prayers start with our sacred medicine. Um, this is another example of more activities. This was done by the Fond du Lac community and Roberta Marie and uh, um, Wendy Savage from Fond du Lac. They held this beautiful fine art exhibition titled The Thema, The Vessel of Connection that traveled throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, and they really gave free reign to some of the artists that they um, chose to work with and asked them to create, you know, their interpretation of traditional tobacco. And we've seen so many different um, components. And this image that you see on the screen um, was one of them offering the tobacco to the water before they were going to harvest um, the traditional um, wild rice. Um, so this was on a, a document titled In a Good Way, um, as well as a part of the Traveling Art Exhibition. Now I believe it's housed at uh, one of their clinics, uh, the clinic bought it. So it's really cool to see just the journey of uh, this image itself. Um, and then we just uh, talking more about the Gona, um, you see more traditional tobacco plants. And in the back, you'll see uh, the words, why our world will never be tobacco free. And a lot of our tribal tobacco education and policy coordinators in Minnesota wrote this article, this peer-reviewed article on, uh, you know, their own experiences and the stories that they were able to share on their journey with traditional tobacco. And we really felt that it was, uh, you know, this pioneering article because it was published in the American Journal of Public Health, talking kind of from their expert point of view um, of, you know, why our world will never be tobacco-free. So often we hear, um, you know, World No Tobacco Day, um, and a lot of our community members say, well, you know, we can't participate in that because uh, tobacco is a part of our daily lives. And so this article really encapsulated what, um, you know, tobacco is and means and why our world will never be tobacco free. 
Um, let's see, next slide is uh, just another image from our very first Gona that we had back in 2015. Um, you see those beautiful plants and the community members that um, you know are now seed keepers and carrying um, the growing of traditional tobacco in their home communities from all over. And um, just a couple of things that's been happening um, in Minnesota, we recently um, have uh, an American Indian specific quit line and uh, we just thank um, our team. We really want to acknowledge um, Lori and uh, the American Indian Cancer Foundation for uh, providing, you know, their knowledge and wisdom to make sure when working with uh, the coaches for this specific quit line that, you know, it was reflective of all these different teachings and uh, you know, when working within the American Indian communities, understanding all the different dynamics um, from traditional tobacco, um, understanding the trauma, the healing, um, and making sure that people would call the quit line and it was respectful, um, you know, of the different ways. And so what you see here is um, one of our coaches who is American Indian from the White, White Earth Nation. Um, you also see the background with with the different floral, floral work, um, you know, very dedicated um, quit line phone number for American Indians um, in Minnesota. And again, these images and, um, you know, artwork was all reflective in collaboration with the community. Um, none of this would have happened unless we got approval um, for the community. So um, just an, another new initiative that just launched in March. So it's a very new, we're uh, learning a lot right now. Um, so maybe uh, next time we'll be able to provide some uh, more updates on how that's going. And then the, um, let's see, this page is just, you know, we're, we're living in both worlds. Um, we're talking about traditional ways. We've talked about the Gona, which was a very in-depth four-day experience um, in, you know, from creating uh, to all these different types of circles. Uh, to also talking about it in different uh, peer-reviewed publications. And so these are examples um, in collaboration with all the tribes that we work with, um, as well as, um, you know, some of the different partners on um, how this work happens in collaboration with community. Um, so we can, if you guys are interested, we can definitely send you um, some of these articles um, to read, but uh, we're, we're very excited and we're very proud because it's always in collaboration. And I, I don't think I can stress stress that enough um, because um, we can't do this work and you know writing about about communities we have to write with the communities from the very beginning they have to all be with us um, you know at the table not on the table is a, an expression that we always like to use because it's so important that uh, you know people tell their own stories not uh, people writing about their stories so that's just something that we're very proud of that um, that these articles have been in collaboration so with that um, I think uh, that is all that we have for you guys. And if you guys have any questions, we would love to um, take those right now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Coco, Lori, and the Honorable Joshua. Um, let me see here. So the first question I have that has come in. Um, so the first person asks if they will be able to get a copy of the slides. So typically we do put the uh, slide deck into the GoToWebinar platform as a handout. However, um, I was not able to get the slides into a small enough format for it to fit on the platform. Um, so what we're going to do is we will upload those slides onto um, keepitsacred.org if it's okay with uh, Coco and Lori. And we will go ahead. Yes, and, that's fine. Uh, awesome. And we'll go ahead and uh, get those uploaded and available to everybody um, for uh, download. We'll also have a, uh, a um, video archive of the webinar today, too. We are recording the webinar. So um, this next question says, is the American Indian quit line for Midwest tribes only? The uh, American Indian Quit Line is specific uh, to Minnesota residents only. So just for American Indians in Minnesota? Yes, um, we do have a, another uh, Quit Line um, that is available to all Minnesotans. Okay. 
and this person asks, um, thank you very much for this webinar. Can you talk a little about U.S. laws forbidding tribes from growing their own tobacco and when that changed, please? Uh, this is Lori. I, I think if you also, um, in addition to accessing the slides on the Keep It Sacred, and um, you look at reclaiming sacred tobacco, there's actually, you could do a screenshot, but there's actually a, a United States document talking about the suppression of ceremonial uh, use and um, Indian ceremonies, practices of, you know, their cultural way. And for each tribe that became part of state, that became part of the United States, that time, that timeline of when it was forbidden is gradient because not all tribes, including my people, our contact or our, um, um, our engagement with commercial tobacco was at a different time period than like the, the folks in the Eastern United States or maybe on the California coast or, you know, in the Southern border. And so it's gradient, but there is well-documented policies. And then with um, once tribes after, you know, the late 18th century, but even prior to that, um, when they were put on reservations, that was also by, you know, by an act of, of, of policy action to prevent and um, it's a it's a period in history where to prevent our way of life and to assimilate through forced assimilation techniques to adopt a, a different way of life and but you can also see in the original founding documents along with you know um, even in the confederate papers I don't I don't know if, uh, are the Federalist Papers, but the founding in the United States, and then the U.S. Constitution, you see the acknowledgement of Indian sovereignty. You see the acknowledgement of Indian culture. But as U.S. federal Indian policy changed over time, um, it became the suppression as the reservation systems and, you know, after 1870 became... And, in, and if you look in um, Minnesota and you start to see the, um, the enactment and the forcible suppression of our way of life, and then in many states, once they gain statehood, they forbid Indians gathering. They forbid indigenous people. So from whatever state you're in, if they, you're, on, you're in Indian country and the indigenous original caretakers of that land they were affected by in some way either state federal or as re as religious orders became um, agents of the u.s government to force us to assimilate to a different way of life they they themselves enacted policy and then some of their basic doctrines and and paradigms and principles they forbid participation in any other types of religion so that's like um, that's like the short answer, but it's also a dynamic part that I think um, you know when we look at some of the principles that together hold our uh, our current world together in all communities across communities, that religious freedom is a founding principle, and so for American Indians, really that was reinstated, if you want to say, or reaffirmed in 1978. And then with a federal update in 1992 of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, where it lifted off as, you know, a federal land, so governing everywhere, every municipality, every, uh, you know, every county, lifted off that suppression. And for us to freely practice our way of life. And if that doesn't tug your heart, you know, and inspire you, if you are not an American Indian, if you are an ally or you want to promote health and well-being in a holistic and a hu universal human love type of way, um, you know, that reignites people's passion because health is, um, is not, a, a, you know, it's not a slipstream of, 
of you know prescribed one one size does not fit all and um i think really that that that's a great question also for all the you know everybody to look at what happened how did we get here today um, but that's my short answer okay um let me see here the next question um the next question is how often is traditional or ceremonial tobacco used I guess I'll hop back on. This is Lori again. Oh, Joshua or Coco, you want to go for it? Lori. You're good. I don't want to say depends. Uh, again, it's a gradient answer. I love that word. You know, sometimes English actually uh, is for the good, you know, but gradient because um, my traditions for my people are markedly different than. Um, there's strong tobacco control advocacy, you know, at the Hopi reservation that has, has been practiced for long. My traditions are different as uh, a rose to a daisy when we compare our, our traditional tobacco use. And traditional tobacco use, it has a definition and a use and a practice far beyond what is the narrow definition of addressing commercial tobacco, of just, you know, uh, incendiary nicotine delivery device, basically, right? Or um, an orally adjusted nicotine delivery advice, um, product. And for us, um, like today, my, you all hear my throat is a little rough. So what I did before is um, I had been a part of collecting uh, wee case which is a natural medicine up in uh, near Lake Man um, Manitoba or Winnipeg um, on Pegwith First Nations. And the way I collected it is I took my Pisaka, my tobacco, my Asema, my Chinchasha, whatever name, and I put it down to establish a relationship with that earth medicine. So in that practice, like now it's the good warm weather and um, I'll be out there again on the land. So our use of traditional tobacco isn't limited, limited to like the perception or the paradigm of commercial, that commercial use has, I, I think, newly introduced. And often I never, in my knowledge, or in my experience, I've never heard an indigenous culture that uses it say, we inhaled deeply and, you know, held it in our lungs. And, you know, sometimes, like, if you look at a pack of cigarettes and, you know, I mean, you just do a little bit of math, um, that if you have 20 um, doses in one cigarette, or, you know, for those really, like, hardcore smokers, you know, who are good people, too, um, you know, if you have 10 to 15 in a pack, could be anywhere from 200 to 300 doses, depending on how you use commercial tobacco. But commercial tobacco is not traditional tobacco. And in our cultural practices, it's, it's not the same. That you, it's like comparing, it's not even apples and oranges. You know, although their apples were indigenous, uh, you know, I don't know about that orange, but, um, so when you're when you're looking at saying how much are they harming themselves by their cultural practices it's really important to look at the context of the use and in ceremony like what is it's just like um you know sacramental wine and some of the churches that you know people aren't you know like ingesting a gallon each because it has a context it has a protocol for restorative spiritual uh, you know health and so but those are really important questions and um i could keep going but i know we're on a time frame but thank you for asking that question thank you laurie 
Um, we do have about six minutes left, so and we've got about uh, four questions left here, so we're going to try to plow through these as fast as we can. Um, next question is, does anyone have experience implementing commercial tobacco control policies with a tribe who manufactures commercial cigarettes? This is Josh uh, with the network. I don't have that information in front of me, but um, if you wanted to email, I could do some research and find out um, some more information on the tobacco policy uh, for some tribes that may be manufacturing tobacco. So a good email yeah. would be, oh, sorry. A good email would be nnn at itcmi.org. And I don't know who I cut off. Sorry, Lori or Coco. It was just Lori and I, uh, just just Lori. Me um, is, I think also you could look at some of the Western states where there is, uh, there's a historical, um, you know, I keep paying, hey, hey in 1790, the Indian Trade and Intercourse Act clearly defined some principles around tribes who, who manufacture or who produce or now who grow. And I think, um, you know, after the, F, the FDA also has a tobacco control office and they live in their grantees, there's a number of tribes who are working on that regulatory manufacturing side. And but in Washington State and and in some other parts of the United States where tribes do maintain that their commercial tobacco venture it has a very complex history in um, much like um, comparing Indian gaming to a traditional ceremonial game of like a, you know stick game or uh, that was originally part of the cultural matrix. Uh, uh, prior to contact, but yes, there's there are a lot of advocates um, that have worked on tobacco policy, even though their economic develop tribal economic um, development ventures may vend or sell or regulate commercial tobacco. So I think that there is a, a hidden army out there of allies that have not been tapped for the mainstream tobacco control movement. All righty, and then we've got about three minutes left. Our next question is, is there a traditional tobacco education curriculum available for adoption with our Northeastern California youth that we may receive or be directed to? Um, I'll go ahead and answer. This is Josh. Um, I see that April Lee Goforth, who is the person who asked the question, is offline, uh, but I will and reach out to her but I do know that the California Rural Indian Health Board does have some really cool uh, traditional tobacco curriculum uh, pieces that they've worked on so that they would be a great resource if you're in California uh, to reach out to the California Rural Indian Health Board which is one of our national partners with the National Native Network. And then this is Lori. I'm going to be real quick. I won't give you a lesson. The T. Scott manual, which is the sacred um, circle of tobacco, um, was produced by the Montana, Montana Tobacco Use Project in, I think, two, 2006. And it is being updated, but it is available on the, the web, and there is guiding curriculum where they did a peer-to-peer -peer training of youth so then that the youth went in to do school presentations and other youth groups. So I think there's been a lot of vibrant work and one of the, um, you know, since 2000, but I also think that one of the challenges that, uh, you know, we're all a part of the solution is to make sure that those curriculums are, again, available. And now we have, you know, if you put something publicly in a PDF on the internet, um, I'm not going to say it's going to, you know, it will be there for a long time. But um, the um, Intertribal Council of Michigan Keep It Sacred website also has 
a lot of good archival links to other efforts here and in Canada. Um, there's Tobacco Wise in Canada that uh, had a very vibrant youth curriculum. Alrighty, and this next question is, are we able to buy seeds to plant our own tobacco? As a CHR in Indian country, we do a lot of health education, as this would be useful useful information to our clients. This is Josh again. Um, I know that there's a couple of websites that you could buy tobacco seeds from, and there's a couple native uh they have some native, um, I don't know if the organizations themselves are native owned or native operated, but I know that there is the capability to purchase seeds. Um, but if you get in contact with the network, we could send you some tobacco seeds. I have seeds that I could send you. And this last question here, um, it says, how is traditional tobacco used? Is it smoked or is there other ways that it is used? Um, this is Josh. I'll just chime in really quickly. So traditional tobacco, as was kind of out, as not kind of as was outlined by Lori, um, there's different prescriptions for the way that traditional tobacco is used. Um, so in some communities, they might not use a pipe at all, or even if a pipe is used, uh, you know, not every person will come into contact with with a pipe and, and a pipe ceremony. You know, so. Uh, Tobacco is used, you know, passing back and forth between people, you, you know, you would hand it to them in a pinch or in a bundle or in a pouch. Um, if you're out harvesting things, you know, you lay it there. Sometimes when you're just praying, you might set it in the river or in the lake or on a rock by a tree, you know, or just, you know, somewhere that you're feeling that you should leave it. Or, you know, if you know you need to pray immediately, sometimes it's just sprinkling it out your car window, you know. Um, traditional tobacco use varies and it depends on the tribe and the way that it is, you know, prescribed through traditional protocols. I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to chime in. All righty. And um, just to uh, move forward, we'll go ahead and start wrapping everything up here. <clears throat> Our next webinar is going to be on June 20th, 2018. The title is Strategies to Address Barriers in Pediatric Obesity and Food Access. You can register by going to keepitsacred.org. And again, we're going to go ahead and archive this webinar. We'll go ahead and upload the video and the PowerPoint slides to the website. And if uh, Coco, Lori, and Josh, um, if, if anybody happens to send in any other resources, we'll make sure to get those up on the web page as well. There is a uh, webinar archives tab on the left side of the website for anybody um, looking to go and share it with any of their partners that uh, viewed it today. And uh, make sure you follow us on social media. We did just open up an Instagram account at instagram.com slash NNN Keep It Sacred. So make sure you follow us on social media to stay up to date on our upcoming webinars, newsletters, presentations, events, all that kind of stuff. And again, uh, tomorrow, the GoToWebinar platform is going to send out an email to everybody that attended the webinar. And uh, it will have a link to a SurveyMonkey link to evaluate the webinar today. And we hope that everybody will take the time to fill that out. And again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you to Coco, Lori, and Josh for presenting today. And thank you to everybody who attended the webinar. Have yourselves a great rest of the afternoon.